Good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's the first Sunday in August already, and welcome to church. To those who are visiting us here this morning, it's really good to have you with us. Thanks for coming along. We're going to be having a cup of tea or coffee uh, after the service, so please do stay and join us if you can. And it's really good to have you with us too, watching uh, on DVD or on YouTube or on Facebook or wherever you happen to be watching. Uh, it's good to have you with us and also those who are listening on CD too. We're glad to have you here on a Sunday. Just a few, a very few items to mention from our church family news. And the first is, you'll have seen on screens here that the new issue of Focus, our church magazine, is out now. And you'll also have seen on screen that it says you can pick one up from a table in the vestibule. But they've been so popular that we don't have any on the table in the vestibule just now. So if you would like one, please let me know and I can get one to you. And the same goes for the future. If you'd like one delivered, we can arrange that too. So that's Focus, Focus magazine. And our other announcements are really just about our regular church activities this week. We've got our prayer gatherings tomorrow at 8 in the morning and 6.30 in the evening. And in case you're, well, in case you're wondering what happens at these, well, I talk a wee bit, we pray a wee bit, there's a bit of relaxing music to ease us in and out, and really that's about it. It's about 10, 15 minutes, it doesn't take, out, take too much out of your day, and everyone who comes along thinks it's a great way to start the week, so everyone, everyone is, is welcome to that. And everyone's welcome, of course, to Coffee and Company on Tuesdays at 10, uh, from 10 until 12. And also everyone's welcome to Let's Talk, which is our Bible discussion group. And that's going to be happening this Thursday, delayed from last Thursday, uh, at 7 p.m. And if you're wondering what happens at that, well, well we, don't, we don't analyze the Bible at it. You don't need to know anything. You don't need to bring anything, a Bible would be handy, but uh, that's about it. It's really just a chance, a chance to chat about what um, certain parts of Scripture mean to us. As I say, that's Thursday at 7 o'clock, and this week we're going to be chatting about Psalm 46. Thursday at 7 o'clock, everybody's welcome to come along to that too. And talking of Psalms, our prayer topic, or <clears throat> excuse me, our weekly prayer topic is based on another Psalm. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, which say, I look to the mountains, where will my help come from? My help will come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This week in your prayers, we're, we'd like to ask you to pray for families who struggle to make ends meet with the rising cost of living, making it so hard to, to pay bills and to, to put food on the table. And we remember that, you know, sometimes... Families are, have issues or saddled with debts and draining resources through unemployment, through addiction, through other issues. So we do ask that they would know God's mercy, his strength, and his peace. Let's turn now to our worship for today. And we'll begin, we'll begin this morning by singing our first hymn. And the first hymn this morning is Rejoice, the Lord is King.
Let's come to him in prayer now. Let's, let's pray. Creator God, Heavenly Father, <clears throat> you're greater than, than just about anything we can imagine. You're better than our, our deepest joy, stronger than anything or anyone in our lives. <clears throat> Today, as we gather here in the church center and watching and listening at home, we gather, we gather offering our praise. Not just for the power that you displayed when you created the world out of nothing, but also for the, the love, the, the love that you hold that creation with in your hands, always. And we give praise too for the way that you've demonstrated your will through, not only through that creation, but through continual recreation too. Through rebirth, a rebirth that continues day by day through your son, Jesus Christ. And we gather giving thanks to Thanks for providing us with the means by which to bring our gifts of money this morning, for which we ask your blessing upon. And we gather giving thanks for your ongoing presence in our lives. Thanks for giving us the people that surround us, those who've stood by us when we're in pain, who've loved us even at times when we've maybe not love them back just quite the way we should. And we gather giving thanks for every opportunity to appreciate and support our, our neighbor, because in doing that, then we are being true representatives of your love. We are only too aware, though, that sometimes we don't, well, we don't repay all that you've given us properly. We're only too aware that sometimes we're not the people that you meant us to be, and sometimes we don't live the lives that you created us to live. We're only too aware that often our thoughts and deeds, our plans and our dreams and our choices, they, well, they damage the world, meaning that we don't just hurt your creation, but we hurt each other too. And by doing that, we, we just we kind of put up a barrier between ourselves and you. So forgive us our, our weakness that causes us to let you down. Forgive us our self-centeredness that disappoints you. Take hold of our lives again. Restore us. Reclaim us as you own. All this we pray in Jesus' name. The same Jesus who taught us to pray the words that we say together now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Anyone been watching the Commonwealth Games on TV? I think it's all due to finish tomorrow, isn't it? <clears throat> I've watched some of it. Um, I've enjoyed some of it. Not all of it. I don't mind the athletics and the hockey. I used to play hockey, so I enjoy watching that. But some, some events, they just, they just kind of leave me just a wee bit cold. They're not, they're not for me, like, like swimming, for example. You enjoy watching the swimming. Agreements and disagreements. So. I'm not fond of watching swimming. And that's probably because I can't do it. <laughs> I can't swim, unfortunately. No, I was, I was always really, really quite sporty at school. I could turn my hand to just about anything but swimming. You know. I even had lessons, uh, adult lessons, not that long ago, a few years ago. The newspaper that I was working for sent me along to some adult swimming classes so that I could write about it. But... Still couldn't do it. <laughs> Still couldn't do it. I swim like a brick. So watching swimming's not really for me. And I can't really understand either why there's all these different strokes. Why they have to have different strokes. Freestyle, breaststroke, butterfly, backstroke. Surely it should just be the fastest one. Should it not? 
in different distances, that's, that's fine. But like in athletics, you don't get 100 meters running backwards, do you? <laughs> Although I'd watch that. It's been all these new sports as well, or, or old sports played differently, like three versus three basketball, beach volleyball. I've actually quite enjoyed some of those. And there's been cricket too. I actually sat and watched you know, cricket for about an hour or so yesterday. And I think it's the first time in the Commonwealth Games there's been cricket there. Uh, and it's just women's cricket. For some reason, they won't let the men play. And it's usually the other way around, is it not? I quite like cricket, but it is another sport that um, I do find it quite hard to get my head around. It's just a bit confusing for me, all the rules. And I read an explanation of the, the rules of cricket once, so I'm going to try to read that to you now. So you've got two teams, one out in the field and the other one in. And each player that's in the side that's in goes out. And when he's out, he comes in. And the next one goes in till he's out. And when they're all out, the team that's out comes in. And the team that's been in goes out and tries to get the team that's coming in out. And sometimes you get players in the team that are still in, but not out. And when both teams have been in and out, including the not outs, that's the game finished. Cricket. <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, the, the reason that I'm talking about the Commonwealth Games and the, and the cricket is it's really because our, our reading that we'll have just in a, a minute or two after the next term has got a, a bit of a sporting flavour to it too. And what's in the reading is a lot easier to explain than cricket although I will let you be the judge of that once I've, after I've spoken later on. But anyway, let, let's sing our next hymn. Our next hymn is For the Fruits of His Creation.
So our reading today is from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 23 to 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 23 to 27. And I'm reading this morning from the, the Good News Version. All this I do for the gospel's sake, in order to share its blessings. Surely you know that many runners take part in a race, but only one of them wins the prize. Run then in such a way as to win the prize. Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline in order to be crowned with a wreath that will not last. But we do it for the one that will last forever. That's why I run straight for the finishing line. That's why I'm like a boxer who does not waste his punches. I harden my body with blows and bring it under complete control to keep myself from being disqualified after having called others to the contest. Amen. Amen. This is the word of God. To him be all praise. And you've hardly had a chance to sit down, but I'm going to ask you to stand again as we sing. Stand if you can. Uh, Stand if you can. And we'll sing our next hymn. It's based on the reading that I've just given. Our next hymn is Fight the good fight. I know that there's at least, at least one person in our congregation who'll remember what it feels like to sit their driving test. She's playing up at the back there just now. Don't worry, Carla, next time. I can't really remember too much about mine, just that I failed my first test and I passed the second one. All the best drivers pass the second time, I'm told. What I do remember, though, is the first time that I was, first time I was out on my own in my first car for the first time, and apart from stalling it in the middle of the road as I left the garage that I bought it from, the thing that I remember most is just this, just this amazement that I was actually in sole control of this big chunk of metal, and I was controlling it with my hands and my feet, and it was doing all the things that I wanted it to do. Actually, it wasn't a big chunk of metal. It was just a wee car. But still, I was in control. I was in control of it, and 
and it felt good to be in control. A car does what you want it to do and when you want it to do it. Most of the time, anyway. Most of the time. You're in control of it. You do have the power. But what about controlling yourself? In the book of Proverbs 16.32, it says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And I take that to mean that it's great to have power. It's great to have control. But if you can't control yourself, then, then it's not that big a deal, really. Controlling a car or taking a city, as Proverbs said, controlling a city, it's nothing compared to controlling yourself, whether it's your, it could be your temper, your, your tongue, or, or, or your thoughts. Because controlling these things takes self-control, self-control. It takes self-discipline. And that's really what I want to think about this morning. When you think of the word discipline, you maybe think of a, of a few things, a parent disciplining a child, a soldier obeying orders, a school teacher insisting the class stick to the rules. They're all, all, forms, of, all forms of discipline, but these are all examples of discipline that one person imposes on another person. It's a bit like dog owners will know, of course. It's a bit like controlling a dog with a leash. You take the dog for a walk up to the, the East Braes or the, the West Braes and you put it on a leash. The dog's controlled, no matter how much it tugs at the leash, the leash, but you have the control. You're imposing control over the dog. And we can impose control, or we can impose control, we can impose discipline on ourselves as well. I have mentioned before in here that I used to smoke cigarettes. And one of the ways that I tried to cut down and eventually, and eventually to give up was this. It's a lockbox with a timer on it. You know, you know me by now, I've got a gadget for everything. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? What you do is you put something in the box and set a timer, hours, could be days, as long as you want, uh, and you kind of get into the box until the timer is done. So imposing control upon yourself. I don't need it for cigarettes anymore, but I do occasionally put my phone in it <laughs> just, just to get myself off that for a while. A gadget to stop me using another gadget. I wonder about myself sometimes. And you probably do too. <laughs> we can use this, this principle with other things too, though. You can put a lock on the fridge. Put a lock on the fridge and give the key to somebody else if you can't resist a, a midnight snack. You can put a, a speed limiter on the car if you've got a problem sticking to the, to the speed limit. But I think the imposed disciplines like these I don't actually think that they work in the, the long run. See, I could break into this box. It is, it's just plastic. I haven't tried. I was tempted quite a few times, but I didn't. I'm sure I could, though. And you can persuade someone to give, the, give you the key to the fridge. You can disable the speed limiter on your car. But there's another kind of discipline that's more important to us, the subject of what I'm talking about, and that's self-discipline. And if we've got it, it does work in the long run. The Bible tends to describe it as, as self-control, and it's one of the fruits of the Spirit described in Galatians 5. <clears throat> the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Last but, but not least. So self-discipline or self-control is important enough to be, um, to be one of the fruits. And it's important in a, in a Christian life. 
It's important because people like me, for instance, I can tell you what you have to do to live a good life. I can tell you how often to, to read your Bibles. I can suggest to you all where and, and when to pray and how to spread God's Word. I can try all of these things anyway, but the only people who can actually do these things are yourselves. And there's only one thing that will stop you from doing them, and that's not having the self-discipline. And I think that's what Paul was talking about in the passage that I read from his letter to the Corinthians. He used the illustration of a, an athletic contest, of a, of a race. And races were, they were familiar to the early Christians in, in Corinth. Corinth is in Greece, of course, and that's the origin, uh, the origin of the Olympic Games, started in Greece. And they also had the Isthmian Games, which were held every, every three years back then. <clears throat> I haven't been there, but I've heard that in modern day Corinth, you can still see the, the starting blocks where the athletes ran from, still embedded in the stones there. And Paul uses this, this illustration because to him, well, to him, life is, life is like a race. And every athlete who competed in Corinth, they had to take an oath. They had to take an oath that they'd been training for 10 months up to the event. And they had to go on strict diets. They had locks on their fridges. No, they didn't have locks on their fridges. They didn't have fridges. They, had, they were on strict diets. And they had to show lots of self-discipline, lots of self-control. But Paul said all they would win would be a wreath. A perishable one, one that wouldn't last. And he says the race that he's running, the race that we all run, it has a prize that, that lasts forever. The way Paul saw life is kind of like this. Our aim is to run this race of life in order to honor God and to be used whenever and wherever he wants to use us. And that, that was Paul's, Paul's main aim. I'm sure he would wake up in the morning with that first and foremost on his mind. For him, for Paul, the objective of his life was to be used by God and to please, to please God. The box just opened. I'm sure all of us ask ourselves the question, we all ask ourselves the question, what am I here for? What's my purpose? in being here on the earth just now. And there's all sorts of answers that you could come up with for these questions. But the answer I'm happiest with is just what I've said that Paul thought, that God, we're here because God intends to use us. He made us. He wants us. He wants us to, to please him. He made us with all the, all the abilities that we've got, all the skills, all the aptitudes, all the all the gifts, so that we can be used by him, so that we can please him. In Paul's illustration of a race, though, he makes it obvious that without self-control, self-discipline, we can't, we can't do that. There's always something in life to distract us, always some temptation or other to seduce us, tempting us to just to sit back and just let life happen to us rather than us directing it. Always some reason to give up rather than go on. I mentioned Proverbs earlier on. Here's another one, Proverbs 24.10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Difficult days will come, but we need the strength the self-control, the self-discipline to deal with them. The hymn that we sang earlier on, Rejoice the Lord is King, was by uh, John Wesley. And you maybe know this, he lived in the, the 18th century. And Wesley was a traveling preacher. He apparently got up at four o'clock every morning and traveled an average of 20 miles a day for, for about 40 years or so. 
He preached about 40,000 sermons. He wrote 400 books. He spoke 10 languages. By his 80s, he'd slowed down a bit. But according to his diaries, he got annoyed. He got annoyed when his eyes started to hurt after about 15 hours a day writing. And he was ashamed because he couldn't preach twice a day anymore. And he beat himself up about having long lies until half past five. Now, I wouldn't for a minute that we take on this kind of schedule, impose this kind of self-control, this kind of self-discipline on ourselves, but there are things that we can do. I'm sure we can. Paul said, I discipline my body and keep it under control. It's easy to think of It's easy to think of self-discipline just in terms of physical health. The reason most people who go to the gym and go to the gym is to lose weight and to look better. And that's also the reason a lot, and I include myself in this at various times in my life, it's also the reason why they don't keep going, (laughs) because they don't get those instant results. But taking care of our physical health is important. It's important for our spiritual lives too. Because if we're always tired, always exhausted, then we can't do the things that God wants us to do. So by showing self-control, by showing self-discipline, and being active and eating well, by giving our bodies the, the fuel that they need in order to carry out God's plans for us. That's what, that's one of the ways to, impose that self-control. And physical health is important, but it's only part of our overall healthiness. Spiritual, emotional health. These bring balance to our lives and help us to live the, the way, live the way God wants us to live. So we have to impose the self-discipline, the self-control upon ourselves to prioritize time, time with God and with our family and with our friends. And these things don't just happen. We do have to make them happen. Paul said in another of his letters, this one to Galatians, he said, the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what our sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. It's all about making the right choices, being on the right side, and that takes that self-control and self-discipline. And we do, yes, we do have to work at it. There is a, there is a battle going on and we do have to be on the, the right side of it if we want to be on the winning side of it. I think, though, when all said and done, the the bottom line really is that having some or a lot, preferably, of self-control, of self-discipline in our lives, it brings us closer to God and it puts us in a better position to hear Him. It causes us to make better choices, helps us to walk in the path that God's got laid out for us. We experience the peace of God, when we're going through hard times, if we've got the discipline to read his word. And then, then we're able to pass that on to others and speak his word into into their lives. None of this comes without effort, but it is worth it. It is worth it. And then one day we can say, as we did in our hymn earlier on, and as Paul said in another of his letters, this one to Timothy, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. Amen. Amen. And appropriately enough, our video hymn for this week, it's called Run the Race. Don't look back to the things behind 
keep your eyes straight ahead on that finish line. Now's the time to be strong. Keep building your faith. Don't let the world slow you down. Put up every I play some of these is really just to, <clears throat> because sometimes the words in a song can speak to us better than any, any, any sermon can, so um, I did like the way, the, the way it was put in that song there. But anyway, let's, let's pray again, let's pray. <clears throat> God, of, <clears throat> God of hope, we come to you today, we, we come carrying all the pains, the, the burdens, the, the joys and the, the triumphs of the week that's gone by as well as the worries and the hopes that we have for the week that's coming up. <clears throat> we have control over what's to come for us and for our small part of the world. But we know that you've got the ultimate control over us and the world and all that are in it. So we bring our prayers to you, our prayers for ourselves and for others. Father, in a world where injustice is the daily experience of so many, we pray for hope and pray for your pray that your kingdom and the promise of it would be a, an example for all those, whoever and wherever they are, all those who are tasked with governance. We ask you to guide them towards truth, towards justice, whatever the cost may be, in the knowledge that this is what you've called them to do and you've called us to do. In a time when our communities struggle with rising costs and with, with social isolation, we pray for compassion and unity for all those in need, for those who don't have the wherewithal to fend for themselves. We ask you to be with them in their fears, assist them in their searching for solutions.
And this is a time too when our churches are searching for their place in a changing society. So we pray for the wisdom to keep on following your teaching, <clears throat> to hear your son, to lean on your spirit. Giving us the guidance, helping us to know that your message must continue to be shared because the world needs it so much. <clears throat> Father, we pray for those who are discouraged, for those who are ill, for those who are dying, as well as those who have recently come to you. Each of us have friends, family, neighbors, acquaintances who need your love and your care and your compassion. And we think of them now, giving them to you in a moment of silence. And we come to you today too with our, our own problems, our own issues, our own worries too. And we come in the prayerful hope that your kingdom will be ever nearer to our lives. And asking that you would continue to help us and support us to live as you want us to live today and always. Amen. So we come now to our closing hymn for this morning. Our closing hymn for this morning is, well, I think it's always a favorite to end a service with, To God Be the Glory.
Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace.